Hi, I'm Dr. Mike and this is NF Geeks. Well, this video is a Thursday theme video. Uh, every Thursday I make a video based on a specific theme so that people on the NF Geeks Facebook forum can make their own video based on that theme and post it, you know, as a response video. And uh, this week um, I've chosen, um, sort of in honor of Nelson Mandela, uh, who died last week and was uh, buried this week, uh, to talk about racism and prejudice and discrimination as a theme. Um, and not to talk about it theoretically, like, you know, how does a, you know, how do, how do the functions create racism or something like that, but to talk about it in terms of personal experience. So um, this video, what I, what I want to try to do is talk about my experience with racism and these things as an ENFP uh, throughout my life and sort of talk about how being an ENFP has sort of shaped this, connected to this, you know, whatever, you know, trying to connect in that. And um, it's, I've been thinking about this for the past day or two, and it's really kind of interesting uh, for me because I've had sort of um, a lot of ups and downs uh, with it, you know, throughout my life. And I don't pretend to know any now as an adult. I don't pretend to know that I know what this is exactly like for any other group or any other type or anything like that. Um, and I'm not going to pretend that I'm not racist or prejudiced or d discriminatory or any of those things. I think that's phony. When people try to, you know, talk about that, I think everybody ends up being racist or prejudiced in some way, and they don't realize they are, or maybe they do. But, um, you know, I, I, I think that's a false morality. I don't think that exists. People, any race, whatever, that say that they don't have this at all. Um, I think the thing you need to do about it is think about it and talk about it. And I think that's the best thing you can do uh, is to actually talk about it. So that's why I thought making a video would be interesting, especially in terms of type and connecting that in terms of type. So I kind of want to take my my uh, journey through it, uh, you know, from childhood, you know, forward, and I want to talk about my background, my my ethnic background, because it kind of affects this. And um, I I am a very unique ethnic background, which is Azorian Portuguese, which means it's Portuguese people, but not Portuguese people from the Iberian Peninsula. It's Portuguese people who live uh, in the Azores, which is which are islands that are you know controlled and run by Portugal. You know, and um, and so people from the Azores have sort of come to the United States to do what all the other ethnic groups did, you know, live, work, whatever. And um, it's a group that is very sort of insular, insular, um, it, 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 much more than other European <laughs> um, groups. Uh, one is because of its size, all right, it's very small, all right, it doesn't exist all over the country, there's that part of it. And it comes from an island, and island cultures... Uh, because they're islands, you know, they don't have a lot of mix of people. They don't have a lot of people in and out, you know, you know, very insulated uh, culture just from that kind of geography. And so that kind of um, culture ends up being rather racist and rather prejudiced. OK. Uh, and also, too, uh, Portuguese uh, people or Azorian Portuguese uh, where I live are sort of last on the scene in the Catholic immigrant migrations that start in the 1890s. So, you know, you have the Irish and this is followed by, you know, Italians and Polish and then there were French Canadians who came down and then there's uh, the, you know, because I'm in New England and then uh, the Portuguese which are last on the list and everybody sort of takes out their own oppression on the next group to come in, you know what I mean? So Irish are very oppressed and they took it out on the Italians or took it out on the Polish or took it out on the French Canadians, you know, so the Portuguese are last on that. Um, so there's that kind of um, stuff and then there's the, the isolated stuff, you know. And so I say that because inwardly in the home there certainly was various sort of you know, racist things that were said about other groups and about African Americans and, and things like that. I, I heard the word nigger growing up, okay, it was there. It wasn't there like every minute, you know what I mean? But it was used, it was absolutely used. I have specific memories about it, you know. So I, I didn't come from a group that was, that was particularly um, multicultural, okay. Now that doesn't mean I grew up racist, but what it means is that I grew up disconnected from other races and things like that and I don't always know how to act 
when I encounter other groups or other people um, ethnically or whatever, you know, I don't always you know what to do because I grew up isolated like that, you know. And so, um, so here are a couple of things that that happen. So I want to talk about my childhood because I think some ENFP stuff comes up with this. Okay. Um, so the first thing is, um, again, I lived in a in an ethnic group in a community that was that no problem being prejudiced or or racist. Okay, because not only did adults, did not not only did I hear the word uh, nigger from adults, I heard it from other kids. When I say other kids, I'm talking like. 10 year olds okay i'm talking about nine or 10 year olds you know uh calling african americans nigger and com not to their face obviously but in conversations with other kids so that's a little scary that racism occurs at that age you know now my interaction with that is interesting and uh, before i say any more i certainly was not some paragon of civil rights as a child and you know was sort of you know fight the power kind of kid or anything like that okay so do I make any kind of idea that somehow I was better than all this or doing something about it I certainly wasn't doing anything about it um, but I, I was raised on Sesame Street and Sesame Street in the 70s when it was cool and um, you know on a heavy dose I mean I never missed Sesame Street and you know Sesame Street had a very multicultural multiracial um, point of view you know which was very forward-thinking for the 1970s and I internalized that so I didn't I didn't in spite of my family and where I was around I didn't have any particularly racist uh, or at least overtly racist attitudes about um, anybody so very idealized about um, this that's my point I was very sort of ENFP I was very sort of idealized or in idealizing the world of Sesame Street you know these are the people in your neighborhood and sometimes they're black okay you know and there was the perceiving thing in that too you know in that uh, okay that maybe this could happen in my neighborhood I have African-American puppets <laughs> you know all right you know I just sort of accepted it yeah this could be true um, but I, but I also sort of have memories of when it was around me and my reaction to it. And I have two that were very strong and they're kind of disturbing because they're childhood memories. These are 10 year olds talking to each other. Um, I have one very distinct memory of one of my school friends sitting on my porch of my house. And I was sort of standing on the sidewalk, kicking rocks around, you know, as kids do, you know, I was like 10. And, um, my friend was trying to explain to me why we should hate black people. I'm not even making this up, okay? This is what he said to me. And um, he was trying to convince me. And looking back at it, I never thought about it this way until I was an adult, that I needed to be convinced I wasn't there. And I, that makes me feel good. You know, at the time, I was just thinking, like, what is he talking about? Why are we even having this conversation? I didn't get it, you know? And he went through this whole list of reasons why we should hate blacks, okay? Um, because they sit on porches. Ironically, he's sitting on a, on a porch. And they do drugs and they sell drugs and all this. And he brought up the the chicken and watermelon thing, okay? And I remember very distinctly thinking like, well, isn't that good? <laughs> you know, don't we all wanna eat chicken and watermelon? What the, you know, this is, I don't get it, you know? So um, my attitude about it at that time you know, and again, I didn't fight against it and says, no, we must, James Martin Luther King. You know, I didn't say anything like that when this kid was saying this to me. But I was sort of in this perceiving mode where I was sort of like, well, I don't know. This may be true. This may be not be true. Who knows? Uh, you know, you know, I'm not going to buy into it. But I mean, it's crazy sound and he's saying it. And OK, but, you know, it wasn't like impacting me either way. I wasn't like rebelling against it, but I wasn't taking it in and internalizing saying, yes, this is how I must be. And I, I credit that to the perceiving stuff of ENFP, you know, and also the fact that we need to see something in action. All right. You know, it, you know that there's that empiricism of the extroverted intuition where we need actually to, to see something taking place for us to buy into it. So I wasn't buying into it, but I wasn't fighting against it either. Okay. A worse one that I remember, um, and boy, I remember this was uh t there was this in this at this jungle gym same friend and another kid there was this jungle gym giant turtle made out of i don't know cement or something that you would climb on you're supposed to climb on and climb off had little steps on it but it was it was kind of big you know this big sort of thing that you're supposed to climb on as a kid and they used to play this game and i swear to god not even making this up they play used to play this game called king nigger of the turtle yes this is this is true and what you had to do is you would climb on the turtle and you had to be knocked off by another kid you know fall on your face and then that kid was the king nigger apparently and then you had to keep pushing him off and fighting them okay 
And I did not like this game for so many reasons. I didn't like the words. I didn't like the term. I didn't like the the point of the game. I didn't like playing it. There was this was just an ugly thing. You know, I always would prefer to play with the Star Wars action figures and go in the house and take out the Millennium Falcon and do that than deal with this craziness. You know, but I remember that very specifically and just being uncomfortable about it. You know, I didn't. I, I definitely didn't like it. I definitely had a feeling of, of discomfort over playing these games or, or being involved in this or just having it around me. You know, and again, it doesn't mean I fought against it or I took some stand. I didn't take any stand. I just didn't like it and I didn't internalize it and didn't like it. But that was about it. You know, I remember. Um, um, it, you know, at one point, my mother in the uh, in my teenage years telling me. Um, that if I brought a, a black girl home, and she might have used the term nigger, I don't know, but if I brought a black girl home, I was going to get kicked out, okay, going to get kicked out of the house, all right. Now, what made this crazy for me is that at this time in the town that I live in, there, there wasn't any African Americans living in the town, okay, like this, like now there are, you know, 30 years later, but at the time, there was none. I... Uh, you know, I didn't know of any African American. Never saw any. I didn't even know what she was talking about. Like, wh where am I going to find one? Let alone bring one home. I wouldn't even know where to go to get one. <laughs> you know, in the, another town like twenty miles away. I mean, it would take forever. You know. In fact, uh, the first time, and again, I had a very naive thing about race and things like that. I still kind of carry that. I think that's an ENFP thing, and that's not always good. Okay, that's not always good. But I, as I'll show, I remember. Um, the first time I actually saw an African American in the flesh and not on television was um, in New York City. I went on a trip to New York City with my mother um, and we took the bus and we took the Port Authority. You know, we get into the Port Authority of, of New York. I'm like 11, you know, at this time. And um, I saw African Americans for the first time. And the first thought I had was, I, I wonder if their skin feels like mine. And, you know, if I touched it, would it feel like my skin? And I kind of just wanted to touch their arm and just kind of do that, you know, very sort of innocently, you know. Now, I didn't because this was in the Port Authority and the African-Americans I'm looking at are winos, you know, sleeping, lying on newspapers, you know, because it was like December, so they're all in there. Um, so, you know, that didn't happen. But just seeing the skin sometimes, you know, made me want to have this sort of tactile experience of it, you know. You know, sort of just, a, you know, I, I think about it very fondly because it was very sort of innocent. You know, it wasn't filled with racism or rage or anything like that. I just wanted to do it. But it did put a scare in me, too, because I was dealing with white I was dealing with people, you know, passed out, again, sleeping on floors in the, in the Port Authority, you know, on newspapers. So that was tough, you know. You know, I, when I became a social worker... Uh, it was uh, difficult. What became difficult about that is I had to directly interact um, with families, you know, sort of professionally. And again, because I didn't have this experience, I didn't know what to do. So here's, uh, here I am as an NF. I want to do these things. I want to connect with people. I want to interact. But there's this whole culture thing that goes on that I'm not able to sort of participate in, you know, uh, be connected with. And that's, you know, and that was, that was really weird. In fact, the first time I met a young African-American mother, um, you know, I'd only been there for a few, you know, just like a few minutes. And she turned to me and she said, you've never been around black people, have you? <laughs> and I said, very honestly, this is a good NF moment, an ENFP moment. I just looked her right in the eye and I just said, you know, sheepishly, but honestly, I just said, no, no, I haven't. You know, it's just honest. And somehow, though, she took pity on me a little bit or sympathy. And that sort of allowed her to open up and ask for my, you know, and connect. And we did kind of connect. And I did have a connection with her after that because I admitted my complete inability <laughs> to deal with African Americans. You know, and that's true, um, you know, about that. One of the more positive events that I feel good about, and this is when some NF empathy kicked in hard, and I'm, I'm proud of myself for this, is that uh, about 15 years ago, I, I used to be a tutor at the, the college I work at. So I used to be a tutor and I used to do English as a second language tutoring. And amongst other tutoring, I did a bunch of subjects, but one of them was English as a second language. And um, there was this young Cambodian girl, about 18, okay, who was um, who wanted some help. And her name was Shantien. And uh, Shantien um, means sunshine in Khmer, okay? There's no such thing as the language Cambodian. They don't speak Cambodian in Cambodia. They speak Khmer, so make sure you get that right. So 
Um, so she's sitting there and she wanted some help and um, I guess I had to correct her paper or something with her, some paper she was working on for class or whatever and um, I totally butchered her name. You know, it's right on the paper, but I, sh I said, oh, you did a, whatever I said, you know, you did really well on this paper, Sean, Dan, teen, Dan, you know, whatever, you know, totally screwed it up. And uh, boy, I never, I'll never forget this. She, she looked off into space. She didn't look at me. She wasn't mad at me at all, but she looked off into space and she just said, just like this, she said, that's okay. Nobody gets my name right. You know, and then suddenly, you know, the NF kicked in. <laughs> you know, the NF, everything kicked in. Like, this kid has suffered this her whole life here in the United States. And she's, you know, and, and so her identity is totally, you know, smashed. And she never gets to be herself. And she never gets to, you know, all that stuff kicked in. And I said to myself, I'll be damned if I ever screw that name up again. <laughs> okay. There was no chance. Zero. That was the first and last time I am screwing up that name. And I know her name 15 years later. I know her name, Shantien. You know what I mean? I, I still pronounce it right because I made it a point to pronounce it right. And I try to pronounce names right of anybody who's of another culture and it's and the name is you know i can't get there the first time you know i'll i'll butcher it i'll do the best i can but then you know i always ask them to do it you know phonetically give it to me phonetically you know you know saying so get it right and that's all because of shantian you know that was one of my better moments with uh with racism and and prejudiceness you know i have to admit um one of the worst moments though i've ever had with it and it's great the reason why it's it's relevant to type is that it's an example of ENFP foot, you know, foot and mouth disease that we're sort of accused of. You know, we say something rather brash that we don't really mean necessarily badly or anything like that. It's kind of misinterpreted a little or the tone is misinterpreted. Who knows? But we say something and we don't even know people are going to be upset about it and they end up being upset about it. This is one of those moments. And sometimes those things happen on NF Geeks and they happen on the forum and all that. And, and um, you know, I've got a sort of grown... Um, uh, you know, I'm used to them now. <laughs> I kind of have a callous about them and like, okay, whatever. But this wasn't one of those whatever, okay, it was bad. And it wasn't bad because something really bad happened, but, the, you know, there was no violence or anything like that. But it was a bad reaction and, and it was never like, it couldn't be corrected and I didn't know what I was doing or whatever. So I used to, um, uh, briefly, I was actually a tutor in a high school program. Uh, which ran classes during class time, and so we were sort of high school teachers, but not actually paid by the high schools of this other program. And it was mostly for tutoring and for other things to help them out with, and, and you know things like that. And it was cool. It was a cool program. Now it was it was mostly African Americans, like more than half, more than maybe as much as two thirds. Um, and maybe even more than that, okay, depending on the day. But it was mostly, definitely a majority of African Americans. Now, I don't remember, oh yeah, no, I do remember. The point I was trying to make was something out of sociology, which is that if, if, a, if a disenfranchised group of some kind, any kind, cannot get their political, economic, or social needs met, okay, by, for whatever reason, or even if it's just even not enough, Okay, a group or an individual will go outside of that system to get their needs met because you naturally need to have, feel like you have some power in society and power over yourself. You naturally want to have your needs met, you know, whatever they are, food, services, you know, materials, whatever. You want that with needs met and social. You want to be able to have the relationships you want to be able to have and have them the way you want to have them. Okay, and if for some reason you can't, um, within the system as it is structured, you will go outside of that system. Okay, and to you know, in order to do that, okay, and so that's sort of the nature of deviancy and crime, uh, to do those things like that. Uh, you can look at organized crime that way, like the mafia, you know, in terms of Italian culture, you know, how did that evolve out of Italian culture was to come around. So I was trying to make that point, and I said something, and this is a funny thing, I don't actually remember what I said because I think I've repressed it because it was so awful, the event, but I said something to the effect of, um, either something that African Americans commit more crimes or African Americans, all African Americans commit crime or something that came across badly about African Americans in crime. Okay, and what I was trying to point, I was trying to make is that African Americans or African American community or culture has to go outside of the, that's what I was trying to say and somehow it came out as African Americans commit most of the crimes or something like that. Okay, it came out really badly and all the kids flipped out 
you know, they all flipped out at me and they were all mad at me and, you know, whatever. And, um, and that's okay. I, not looking back on it, it's all right. But, you know, I, I didn't know how to handle it in the moment because I was trying to say something else about their life and that because this thing happened, the point I was trying to make got obviously got lost you know, uh, lost in the moment, or I might have been able to get there a day or two later, but he, by then, they I don't know what they thought about it, um, you know, that maybe that's not what I really meant, or something, I don't know, but um, it, it in the moment, it was too bad, because I was trying to communicate something, and obviously, I'd said something in a way that was really bad, and I didn't even know what I was saying, so, and that's what I learned, that a lot of racism um, is is ignorance, now you know that doesn't justify it that's not an, an excuse for it but the real source of it is ignorant and not knowing your not doing your homework you know that's really what it means you know it means uh you know that you know doing that um all right two last things i want to talk about regarding racism is that one was um uh one thing i've noticed in massachusetts this is interesting i have a theory a racist theory uh is that um, there's more, I don't know if this is in other parts of Massachusetts, but in the part of Massachusetts I live in, there's a larger and larger African American population which has grown. Okay, it, it's grown much larger. And I noticed that a lot of African Americans that live around me wear New York Yankees stuff. Okay, Yankees hats and Yankees shirts and a lot of New York Yankees stuff around. Now, this is Red Sox Nation. <laughs> okay, I live in I mean I live in full blown Red Sox Nation, okay? And in the past, if you wore Yankees things around, people would accost you to if people you didn't know, strangers, would accost you in in like you know, in like a drugstore or in a little, you know, in a, in a gas station or somewhere. Now, granted, it wouldn't be like violent, but you'd be like, what are you wearing that for? You come in here and my store, did you see that this is a Red Sox? But, you know, there'd be like a little exchange that went on. And this happened lots of times. Okay, Red Sox Nation has this real sort of us versus them, evil, good versus evil thing going on with the New York Yankees. Okay, so if you wore a Yankees hat, a Yankee shirt, Yankees anything, you know, you would definitely face ridicule by strangers okay and, and look I've seen this a hundred times all right in my life now you know African Americans wearing Yankee stuff don't get nobody says anything to them and there's this race thing that goes on here with this because Red Sox fans are mostly white okay there is some sort of white thing that goes on with the Red Sox that doesn't necessarily go on with other sports and even in New England but like Red Sox fans are for the most part white okay very white and there's some sort so there's a racism that goes on in Red Sox Nation sort of unsaid and that's old that's gone on for a long time and so here's this other thing you know this other thing going on between black and whites regarding the Yankee symbolism and nobody says anything about it you know there's never like a um, you know a discussion that would happen between whites wearing you know Yankees Red Sox so that's really kind of interesting and it shows that you know I don't know we haven't come a long way <laughs> because we can't talk to each other normally you know like we can't just you know that somehow race comes in between something uh, like that now granted that's not a wonderful thing you know Yankees Red Sox rivalry or whatever I'm not even sure that the African Americans wearing Yankee stuff or care about the Yankees it might be just style I have no idea I don't I don't have that conversation either but I don't talk to anybody around here um, but there's something going on there racially that's that the silence between Red Sox fans and African Americans wearing Yankee stuff is evidence of some kind of racial divide going on because Red Sox fans would never do that if it was a white person. Psh, they'd go nuts. All right. So I got one last thing uh, to talk about. Um, it's it's kind of comical. I, I want to end on something happy, but it's a weird racial moment that occurred um, it, 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 with me in class that... It's actually fun to say, and nothing bad came of it, and that's why I can I can talk about it. So, um, one day, one time at the beginning of the semester, okay, it's like the first day of class, and I, I think I'm teaching. I think this is an ethics class. So I'm teaching ethics. It's like noon or something, and so um, most of the class is there. It's right before we're about to start, and it's like 15, 16 white kids, you know, 18 or whatever, and and one black kid. Okay, just one. So one black kid, 15, 16 white kids, okay, sitting there. And so I'm looking over the roster, okay, you know, take attendance. It's like two minutes to the beginning of class. And I look at all the names, and one of the names is Hakeem, 
Okay, that's one of the names. So now I have this conundrum of how I'm going to handle this. I remember, like, ah, oh, damn. You know, how am I going to handle this? All right, uh, because I felt that both options are ridiculous. Okay, and again, this shows how race is still around. Um, the first, so the first thing I could do is look around the room and pretend that any student in this room could be named Hakeem. Okay, so I could look at the room, even though there's one black kid, he's sitting right there, I could look around and go, Hakeem, 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 oh, Hakeem, you know, and do that, okay. Or I could just do this, you know, the, the kid's sitting right there and look at the name and go, Hakeem, you know, <laughs> and like, you know, just look at the kid. Who else is going to be named Hakeem in this room? You know, so it, it was a misery, you know, to figure this out. So what I, what I, and hopefully people will think this is the right thing to do. I think it was the right thing to do. I decided that the right thing to do was to do the first option because even though the chances of any of these white kids being named Hakeem is slim to none, that kid's name might not be Hakeem because Hakeem might be some other black kid who is still going to be coming to class or withdrew. And I don't know that. It's still on my roster. So I don't know that that, that his name is Hakeem. Okay? I, I, it, it's unlikely that any of these white kids it's possible, but it's not likely these kids are named Hakeem. But it's, not, it's very possible that his name is Hakeem. So I did option number one. I went Hakeem, Hakeem. You know, now of course, guess what? That was his name, of course. <laughs> he was Hakeem. So, you know, and then it was fine. It turned out fine. But it's it's kind of comical thinking back about what about that situation. You know, right? Automatically, I you know, for two minutes, I was like, oh my god, how am I going to navigate this thing? So, I think I did it right. And so, um, at least I did that one better than you know the other time in the, the other class. So, all right. So that's it. So talk about your um. Um, your issues with racism and how it connects to your type and uh, what kind of experiences you've had. And I think that would be very fascinating. All right. Oh, and don't forget, um, follow NF Geeks on Tumblr and Twitter. And uh, also join us at the NF Geeks uh, forum on Facebook and uh, new NF Geeks videos every Tuesday night at 8. And don't forget, it's happening. So it's happening and let's make it happen.